Hi, I'm Rob. I'm going to talk about evaluating climbing anchors. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the rigging that joins multiple pieces of pro together to form an anchor. And the acronym SERENE. I am not going to talk about how to place pro in the first place. If you want to learn to place pro, I highly recommend that you read one of these two books, uh, find a reputable organization that can give you first-hand instruction, double check your work, and give you feedback before you trust your life and someone else's life to the gear. When talking about anchors, the name of the game is SERENE. SERENE is an acronym that stands for solid or strong, efficient, redundant, equalized, and no extension. So solid means that every piece of your anchor is bomber, and by that we mean bomb-proof. There's absolutely no way that it can fail. Each piece individually is really well set in the rock so that you trust every one. The rock itself is solid and the materials you make your anchor out of are strong enough for the task at hand. Efficient means efficient both in terms of time and gear consumed. More time or gear used, the less efficient your anchor is. Redundant means that if any one piece of your anchor is cut, breaks, or accidentally unclips, your anchor as a whole does not fail. Equalized means that all pieces of your anchor share the load. If I pull here, there's partial load on each one of the legs of the anchor. No one piece is getting loaded all at once. And finally, no extension means that if a part of the anchor does fail, that the, the clip-in point stays right where it is. Serene is not a strict checklist. Don't simply try to make every single letter perfect. As a matter of fact, many of the letters trade off against each other. The more redundant an anchor is, the less efficient it is. Or, the more equalized an anchor is, the greater chance of extension if one piece fails. Different situations have different needs, so you need to decide which letters of the Serene acronym are most important for your current anchoring situation and make trade-offs. Nothing in this video is a strict rule that you must follow. Everything is situational, everything is judgment calls. You and your partner must decide for you yourselves what is safe enough for you. It's okay if you do things differently than I do. There's more than one right way to do things and it would be impossible to cover everything in one video. The first type of anchor I'd like to talk about is the one that I use most. It's very common and it's fairly simple. The cordelette tied off with a power point. The parts of the cordelette include the power point or the master point and the shelf. When I say cordelette, I'm often referring to a big loop of cord. In this case, I've got seven millimeter nylon, started with 20 feet of it and tied it in a giant loop with a double fisherman's knot. Usually I carry this on my harness uh, wrapped in a tight package. I loop the knotted part over my thumb and I weave back and forth between thumb and pinky finger to make sure that it's all wrapped up nicely when I get close to the end, keep my fingers in that top loop, and then I wrap the cord around itself, pulling nice and tight as I can, and then finally, I feed the little tail of the loop through the top there, pull it tight, keeps it all nice and organized when it hangs from my harness. Then, when I need to build an anchor, all I have to do is let it fall out like that. I've got three pieces of pro placed here. Make sure that I've got beaners on each of them. I start by clipping close to the knot. For neatness, I have the knot clipped on the outside and you can keep the cordelette from moving around in later steps by doing a clove hitch here. Easy way to do a clove one-handed is to make a little loop that pinches 
the middle strand between the longer strands. Then I'd bring that loop without turning it sideways over to the gate and clip it in. Quick one-handed clove. And I clip to all of my other pieces of gear. Take a locking carabiner and clip in between all of the pieces of gear. So I've clipped three strands there and then I simply pull down until I've got them all together uh, and grab all of these. I'm, I'm pointing the locker in the direction of pull that I anticipate the anchor to use. Right now I'm going straight down, but if it was off to the side, I could point the locker over here before grabbing all the strands. Grab the strands, I'm gonna bring the locker up, and I'm going to tie a figure of eight knot here. And I'm adding a second locker at the power point. Power point. And then for the shelf, taking one strand from each piece of Pro and clipping in there. Let's see that building of the cordelette anchor again. I start by clipping close to the knot in my cordelette into one piece of Pro. You want to keep the knot high near that piece of Pro, but not so much that the bend of the, the cordelette is where the knot is, so just below that carabiner. Then clip into other pieces of Pro. Take a locking beaner that's going to end up at your power point and clip it in between each of the pieces of Pro. So clipping three strands because I have three pieces of Pro. Then I pull that so that everything equalizes here and I go down towards the direction of my pull that I anticipate. If the pull's off to the side, I go off to the side, but I anticipate my pull to come from straight down. Grab all the strands, and now I'm going to tie a knot that joins everything together. This can be an overhand, a figure eight, a figure nine. The bigger the knot, the more material you use up, and you can change the height of your master point. The AMGA has a good video on tips and tricks for adjusting your master point higher or lower. So, notice that my knot did get a little bit bound up in the carabiner up here. The way that I can fix that, I'll show demonstrating building the uh, cordelette anchor again. If I want to keep the knot from moving around while I build my anchor, again, I start close to the knot and I clip that to one of my pieces of Pro. I'm going to do a clove hitch to keep the knot in place. So I've got the knot on the outside. An easy way to do a one-handed clove is to grab the strand that's opposite the gate side. So I bring the strand away from the gate and I'm going to make a loop that pinches this short piece between the two longer strands. You see how that's in the middle of the two longer strands there? And then I'm going to bring this loop without any rotation, just move it sideways and then move it back into the, the gate there. And there's my clove hitch. Then clip into the other pieces, clip my locker for the power point into all three strands, pull until they all equal out. So whatever your direction of pull is, go in that direction. Once you've got it in your direction of pull, grab all the strands, then tie your knot. Here's a figure eight, and I'm passing the PowerPoint beaner through the bottom. And I'm gonna add a second beaner to my PowerPoint for whatever I may need. So, you see how the clove hitch kept that in place. The term cordelette could refer to either the 20-foot loop that I originally made this out of, or it could refer to this type of rigging of an anchor. A lot of climbing terms are ambiguous and used in multiple ways. Sorry about the confusion. When using a cordelette anchor, you can clip into either the power point or into the shelf, 
but make sure that you always have at least one beaner down here in the PowerPoint. The reason for this is that if you don't have a beaner here and there's enough force on your anchor um, on the shelf, it can cause the figure eight knot here to capsize over itself as this pulls down and you may have clipped into strands that weren't connected, having your beaner just fall off the bottom. Instead, by always having a beaner down here, even if the knot does flip over itself, it's blocked when it hits the beaner. So, what makes this anchor serene? Or how does this anchor evaluate on each of the letters of our serene acronym? Is it solid? Well, each of the pieces of Pro is well placed. You also want to look at the rock around the Pro and think what parts of the rock are most likely to fail. If the answer is any of them, probably best to either build the anchor someplace else or at least add more pieces to make it more secure. Is it efficient? Well, how much gear did I use to have to build this anchor? I just needed the one cordelette and the lockers for the PowerPoint. Is it redundant? Triply so. There's no one place that I can cut that will cause the whole anchor to fail. I like two beaners in the PowerPoint to make even that point redundant. Or if the rock were to fail around any one piece of Pro, the anchor as a whole stays in place. Is it equalized? Mostly. The cordelette, uh, as long as it's pulled in the exact direction that you've tied it for, then the load is equalized over the legs. But as soon as it gets pulled in a direction other than what you originally tied it for, all of the load goes onto one leg and the other legs are slack. So, okay unequalized, but not perfect. And for no extension, if any one piece gets unclipped, the PowerPoint is right where we tied it in the first place. The cordelette anchor like this is a pretty good balance of all the letters in Serene. One of the best types of anchors you can get while climbing is a tree. Since I'm indoors and I don't have a tree available, we're gonna use this metal post here to simulate one. Uh, in reality, when you're using a tree as an anchor, uh, very first thing you wanna do is look up. You wanna look for green leaves, make sure that the thing is alive. Never use a dead tree as an anchor. Um, other than that, I'd say bang on it, make sure that it's really solid in there, and make sure that it's of a size that really inspires confidence. Uh, this would probably be the very tiniest tree that I would trust. I'd really like to see it be two or three times uh, the diameter of this metal post. But uh, if we want to use our tree, get out our cordelette, stretch it out. And so what I'm going to do is take, take a bite of the cordelette and I'm going to feed it around behind my tree. Stretch out those ends, get the knot in close to the tree. Okay, so now I've got one U of the, the cordelette coming around either side. I've brought them together and I'm going to tie a power point just like we've done so many times before. Do a figure nine there to shorten up some distance. And then you have the power point just as before. Uh, but if you want to use the shelf, one notable important difference is that um, rather than clipping one strand from either side, you want to clip both strands on the same side. A few things to keep in mind beyond just serene for any anchor. There's also the V angle between the pieces. I like to use the Spock test so that you live long and prosper. As long as the angle between the pieces is smaller than what I can do with my fingers here, then I'm happy about it. If instead 
one of the pieces of pro was far off to the side. Maybe we'll move this one too. If we stretch things out, if we stretch things out like that, then the forces are hugely multiplied because the angle there is practically 180 degrees between those pieces. Instead, we want to keep our V angles narrow. Sometimes we have to do some extra problem solving before we can finish our cordelette anchor. Let's say, for example, that this piece wasn't nice and close to all the others, but instead it was way far away, far over here. If I tried to clip into that piece and then bring all the strands together, clipping all three there, pulling, and then tying off. I have a huge V angle here that doesn't pass the Spock test. That's gonna multiply the forces on the pieces of gear out on the edges and increase the chances that one of them will pull out. Instead, what I can do is extend a leg by clipping a sling into the same piece of pro, extending that out so that it's close to where our original two other two pieces of pro are, clipping in there, and now I can finish my cordelette just like we did before, clipping in between each of the pieces of pro with a locker that's going to form my power point, pulling that in the direction of pull that we are going to have, bringing it all together tie in a knot, and I can do an overhand to give myself a little bit more available cord in the cordelette. And our V angle is much closer to what we actually want it to be there. Another rule of thumb is that we generally don't want to clip beaner to beaner or have fabric directly hitched to fabric. It's just a rule of thumb. There are exceptions, but in general, uh, if you go fabric, beaner, fabric, just like kindergartners are forced to sit boy, girl, boy, girl, um, you prevent some problems. For example, if you've got two beaners clipped to each other, if they were to rotate, it's possible one could pull on the gate of the other. Or, if you have two pieces of fabric, and you girth hitch them together. It makes this really small, really tight bend in the fabric. And the tighter a bend is in any fabric climbing material, the more it weakens it. This girth hitch in Skinny Dyneema cuts the strength more than in half. So it's much better to use a beaner to clip there. Another consideration for any anchor is the risk and consequences of an upward pull. For example, you've all seen a belayer belaying a lead climber who takes a big whipper and the amount of force lifts the belayer off the ground. If the belayer is connected to the anchor and they're lifted, what happens? Let's say instead of a cam over here, which sometimes is a multi-directional piece, we had a passive piece of pro. So let's say that I'm about to belay a lead climber. Uh, I would have tied in to the anchor. I like to use a clove close to me and I cinch it down so that it's not too far away. And then I give myself some slack and I tie a figure eight on a bite as a backup. On another carabiner, you could go to the PowerPoint, you could go to the shelf. So I've got my redundant connection to the anchor. And then let's say I'm gonna belay a lead climber. And so I'm belaying, I'm belaying, and then they fall and I get lifted up a huge amount. So when I get lifted, this is my tie-in knot and I go flying. If I go way up there, it's 
possible that we lift all of the pieces of pro up and out and you have no anchor anymore. So a way to fix that is to place some other type of pro down low that's going to take an upward pull. If I can get a piece of pro in here and clip that to the power point such that any upward pull is limited by this, then we're good to go. If you have to place your pro far away, you can always take a sling, clip it to the power point. and then clip it to the pro. So now, when there's an upward pull, it only goes so far, and we don't lift the individual pieces of the anchor out. Of course, the other solution is to just use types of pro that are multi-directional in the first place, but you don't always have that option, and sometimes you need these pieces for the next pitch. So for cordelette materials, my favorite is 7mm nylon tied with a double fisherman's knot. Another option that is lighter uh, for those alpine climbs are tech cords. For example, this is Blue Water Titan. It's 5.5 millimeters in diameter, and it has a core made out of Dyneema. Uh, it's much skinnier and lighter uh, because the Dyneema is much stronger. However, since Dyneema is slippery, you need to make sure that anything with Dyneema is tied with a triple fisherman's knot. If you're dealing with an anchor that only has two pieces of pro rather than three, you could also tie your cordelette anchors out of a simple double runner. Here I've got a nylon double tied with a water knot and all the same principles. I'm going to clip in near the knot, I'm going to clip into the other piece of pro, and then I'm going <clears> to <throat> use a locker and clip in between the pieces of pro. Since there's two pieces of pro, clip two strands, pull that in our direction of pull, and then bring it up and tie a knot to form a power point. And there I've got a two-piece essentially cordelette anchor, even though I didn't build it out of a cordelette. Quick way for racking doubles that I like to do is take the double, fold it in half so that you've got a loop that's half as long as the original double, and then twist the heck out of it. Keep twisting until you can't twist anymore, bring the ends together and clip it, and the nature of the twists make it a nice neat little package. Another rule of thumb is that if I have three pieces of pro, as I often do with trad gear, then I'm totally fine with non-lockers on each, because what, what are the odds that all three non-lockers are going to come unclipped? Sometimes though, when I'm building an anchor off of a pair of bolts, um, or, or any other situation where I've got two points rather than three, then I'll use lockers on the pro instead. So here's that two-point cordelette style anchor with the nylon double runner again, but with lockers at all points. So how do we feel about the sereneness of this anchor? Well, solid. We've got two bolts, and they're pretty solid bolts. They're not some spinner like this guy over here. Um, it's efficient. I only had to use a double and a few beaners. Um, it's redundant. Um, even if one of the bolts were to pull out of the rock, which is rare but does happen, then our anchor does not fail completely. 
Um, is it equalized? Again, just like with our original cordelette anchor, sure, it's equalized in this one direction of pull, but we don't have quite perfect equalization if the direction of pull changes. It ends up with one of the arms being slack. Um, and no extension. Yeah, if this piece comes unclipped, our power point does not move significantly. Also, if I have two pieces of Pro, then I would rather use my cordelette and save that double for the leader to be able to use on the next pitch, you can essentially make your cordelette into a double by folding the whole thing in half. So I've got my big loop. If I bring this together so that it's still a loop, but now one of two strands, it's essentially a double. And so I can take this and treating both strands together, just like I rigged the uh, anchor with the, the nylon double. I'm clipping close to the knot, clipping over here. Since I'm treating two strands as one, I've got two pieces of pro. I need to clip two of these, these double strands here. Stretch that out in our direction of pull, grabbing it all and tying a knot. And I've got essentially the same anchor as our cordelette before, but with two pieces of pro. For recognizing materials, nylon is almost always wider and dyed a specific color. So here's a nylon runner, whereas Dyneema um, is skinnier, and Dyneema itself does not hold a dye. So if you can see the Dyneema, it will be white. This has a little bit of nylon on the edges so that it's color-coded. Um, Sometimes the Dyneema is hidden inside of the sling, as in the case of the Blue Water Titan cord, uh, so you won't see it. For tying the knot in your cordelette to make it one big loop, if it's seven millimeter nylon, um, a double fisherman's is the way to go. If it's something like the Blue Water Titan cord uh, with its Dyneema core, then you need a triple fisherman's in order to uh, counteract the slipperiness of the Dyneema core. With the seven millimeter, there's other options. Instead of a double fisherman's, I could also tie a rewoven figure eight, much like our harness tie-in. The important thing to notice with the rewoven figure eight is that the strands that are pulled are coming out of opposite ends of the knot. This is pulling the knot in line with its strongest axis. Uh, another knot that you could use is a flat knot. Flat knots are quick to tie because you just take the two ends together and there is a flat overhand. But the difference here is now, instead the pull is pulling apart the knot. A little bit like grabbing the legs on a wishbone and pulling them apart. And this is not the strongest orientation for most knots. The flat overhand that I have here works, but I would recommend very long tails. If you're joining rappel ropes, they need to be at least a foot of tails. Never tie a flat figure eight. A flat figure eight is extremely likely to pull apart because you're pulling um, not along the axis of the knot but pulling it apart like a wishbone and it's very possible for it to uh, capsize over itself flipping on down until it comes off the end like that slightly better, but I don't use it often, is a flat overhand. While I don't use this rope for tying my cordelette, I do use it and trust my life to it when I'm joining two ropes together for a rappel, but that's a different topic. How about this anchor?
So, Serene, uh, is it strong? Well, if we're doing two, two bolts, uh, this one's a bit of a spinner. I would uh, look at it carefully, but I've decided in the end that I trust these two bolts and that they are both strong. Uh, is it efficient? Well, I had to use some extra gear. Rather than using one cordelette, I had to use two separate slings. Um, is it redundant? Yeah, uh, if I wanted to make it even better, I could replace these with lockers, but depending on your judgment call of like how much the anchor will be used and how long it's gonna be up, um, non-lockers are okay as well. Um, is it equalized? Uh, so just like the cordelette, it's equalized as long as we have this one specific direction of pull. As soon as we get off into one direction, then one becomes slack and the other is holding all of the load. So it is no better than the cordelette on equalizing. Um, and no extension. If something does fail, if that bolt really was questionable and did pull out, then we extend slightly, but not a ton. Uh, the thing though is with this anchor, it really depended on having these two bolts be at the same level. If I had set up on these two bolts and had two separate slings, then even right from the beginning, it's not equalized. Uh, one of them is slack and the other is holding all of the load. The cordelette makes it a little bit easier to equalize because you measure the legs to match the need at the time that you tie it. Okay, to illustrate that Serene really is just a tool for making trade-offs and not trying to get perfect on every single one, let's look at some other types of anchors. So here, let's say that I've got two bolts that I'm gonna build my anchor on. Um, this next anchor type is called the sliding X. I'm taking a double Dyneema runner and I'm clipping it not close to, or the stitching close to one carabiner, clip it into the other carabiner, so now I pull the strands down together till they're at an equal length. And the key here, well, if I just clipped a locker in here, how does this do on our serene criteria? Well, is it strong? Yeah, two good bolts that we've, we've checked out. We don't see any rust on. We trust the strength of it. The Dyneema runner itself is very strong. The loop is rated for 22 kilonewtons. Um, so yeah, we, we've got the strong, solid thing checked off. Efficient, relative to the cordelette, I only used a double rather than the whole long cordelette, so less gear that I have to carry. But now let's talk about redundancy. Um, is this anchor redundant? Well, if one piece of gear were to fail, then the way I had that clipped, it just slides right out of the beaner. So that is not redundant in any way, shape, or form. How can we fix that? <clears throat> so instead, if I take the two strands coming down and twist one 180 degrees and then clip it in there, this creates an X. So now, if one of the anchor points fails. This is going to pull and still be around our beaner in the end. Okay, so that helped the redundancy in case one of the bolts pulls out or in case one of our lockers somehow breaks. Um, but what parts of our system are not redundant? Well, if this were to rub across a sharp rock and clip a single strand of this, then the whole thing would fail. Um, so our material without any knot in it is no longer redundant. Um, also, thinking about, um, thinking about equalized, no matter where the direction of pull comes on this, it remains equalized. So it does better than our cordelette anchor on equalization, but on no extension, as soon as I unclip this, look how much our power point moves. And it does stop um, at that point. It doesn't extend forever, but that is quite a bit of extension.
So, another anchor type that we can talk about the sereneness of is taking our sliding X and adding limiter knots. So, I'm coming a little bit down from the stitching and then I'm tying a figure eight in line there. I'm deciding I want the power point to be down here, so I want to come back up on the other side, tie in another figure eight. And if you leave these knots loose, you can adjust them. And again, let's put that 180 degree twist in there before we clip. So now, talking about the SERENE acronym. Is it strong and solid? Yes, we still have the same two bolts. We're still making it out of the same material. Um, remember that bends in the material do weaken them slightly, but since I did figure eights, they put slightly less of a bend. Overhands would have been fine too, um, but it is slightly less strong than it was before, but it's not enough to really make a difference. Don't worry about it. Um, Redundant. Uh, so now what happens if if a bolt fails? We're in that sliding X and we pull down to that point. So in terms of equalized, yeah, it still equalizes, but not quite as much. As soon as we hit one of those stopper knots, it stops equalizing. Um, and in terms of extension, if something gets unclipped, we only extend that far. Um, so there's less extension than, than before. So the sliding X with the double runner that I just showed with with or without limiter knots. It's not an anchor that I use very much, but it's a nice lead in to an anchor that I do use. So, bringing out our cordelette again, I'm gonna rig it very similar to the sliding X with uh, limiter knots. Um, to make my loop smaller, I'm gonna fold it in half. So now I've got one loop of two strands that's half the size. Um, and I'm gonna make an anchor called the quad because it'll end up with four strands in the middle. So, clipping that in to, to one beaner, keeping the knot there. I'm gonna tie my limiter knot. Since I've got so much material here and it's a thicker material than that Dyneema, I'm just gonna use overhands. So the quad, has four strands down here at the bottom. One, two, three, four. And there's a couple ways that you can clip in. Um, if you're setting up a top rope, a lot of people will clip three strands with two opposite and opposed lockers for the top rope to run through. And so thinking about the SERENE acronym with this, is it strong and solid? Yeah, again, we still have the same two bolts. Um, the, the material of the cordelette is, is strong and not to mention um, we've got so many strands sharing the load that this is really really overkill in terms of strength but that's that's okay is it efficient well it uses about the same amount of gear as our cordelette anchor and it did take me a little bit of time to to tie these two separate knots rather than one big knot but a big advantage of the quad is that you can keep it set up And then it's ready to go clip into another pair of bolts uh, next time you need to set an anchor and you're just ready to go. Um, another way to clip in here, uh, before we had uh, three strands all clipped with one beaner, if you're on a multi-pitch and you've got two different climbers that you want to uh, are pulling in separate directions, you can have each clip two different strands so that they aren't pulled um, the same direction. Is it equalized? Yes, very much so. But as we said before, equalization comes with a small penalty of extension. That if one piece fails, it does extend some, but only as far as the limiter knot allows. Etc. 
extension isn't bad. It's all just about making trade-offs for what the situation uh, needs. Is equalization better or is limiting an extension more important? For another type of anchor, what do we think about this? So, it's a climbing anchor just like any other. It's one that you see pretty often at the top of sport crags. Usually these two bolts are much closer together, so the V angle isn't as terrible as I've got it here, but I just have to do this for the sake of example. Um, so. What do we think on Serene? Uh, is it strong? Um, yeah, still two bolts. Um, so just as strong as all the other two point anchors we had. Um, is it efficient? Yeah, that was extremely efficient. I just clipped in two pieces of gear and I was done in seconds. So definitely more efficient than the anchors we've talked about so far. Is it redundant? Yeah, it's redundant. Like even if, even if one fails, uh, we haven't lost the complete anchor. Um, if you wanted to make it a little bit more confidence inspiring, you could make your draws out of lockers instead. But if I'm going to have only one more person top rope after leading a, a sport pitch, uh, I think this is a totally acceptable anchor. If I was setting up a top rope um, at the crag that a lot of other people would climb or I was doing some instruction, then I would use the quad with all lockers uh, so that nothing goes wrong when I leave that unattended for a while. But for short use, uh, this is a nice, efficient anchor. So yeah, redundant, um, equalized. Yeah, we're sharing the load between those two bolts. And in terms of no extension, how much extension do we get here? Moved a tiny bit, but like vertically, that was less than an inch, so it was very little extension. Or, what about this anchor? So, I quickly built an anchor and have a follower on a munter hitch. Um, so, let's talk about the Serene here. Is it strong and solid? Well, I've got two pretty good cams in rock that I trust. Since I'm only doing two pieces of trad gear, this only really works when the rock is super bomber, the cams are completely reliable, and uh, I really prefer three pieces in trad anchors, so this is for pitches where I don't think my follower is going to fall. Five dot easy. Um, but if speed is an issue, uh, this is extremely efficient to build. I didn't use any extra gear. I didn't use uh, my cordelette. I didn't need a whole lot of extra lockers. I didn't even need to tie myself into the anchor because I'm building it out of the very rope that I'm tied into. So on efficiency, this thing is extremely efficient, but it's making that trade-off over uh, being less redundant because there's less pieces in it. It is still redundant, even if a piece were to fail. Um, we haven't lost in everything, but I'd feel really uncomfortable hanging from a single piece as my only anchor. <clears throat> um, in terms of equalized, well, Depends on which part of the anchor we're talking about. If we're talking about where I'm belaying my follower, um, then it is equalized between both pieces. But what about my tie-in point? Am, am I equalized? No. When I sit back on this, 
I'm, I'm only pulling on one cam, um, and at least if this does fail, I'm still protected by the other, but with some considerable extension. So again, this is the kind of fast and efficient alpine anchor that you only use on easy ground when you've gotten really good at pitching it out with three-point anchors. You really know what you're doing, and you're just trying to shave speed, because sometimes in the mountains, speed is safety. What if I've got a three-piece anchor, and equalization matters to me more than avoiding extension? Um, an option for that is called the Equilette. So for the Equilette, I'm gonna clip one arm in here, and I'm gonna come down and decide where I want my master point. If I want my master point to be here, then I wanna come up a little bit, tie a limiter knot, So again, looking at where that master point is, if I want it to be there, then I want to come up to the other side, tie a limiter knot. And then do clove hitches to the other two pieces of pro. And you can adjust the clove hitches so that the legs are relatively equal in sharing the load. And then we do the twist just like the sliding X before and clip it in here. So um, this, this extra tail is essentially not used. Talking about serene with this, is it solid? We look at the pieces of Pro and the rock quality they're set in. Um, is it efficient? Uh, it didn't take any more gear than before, but those are a lot of knots to tie and a lot of clove hitches to tie. It took me quite a bit of time to set up, so it's less efficient. Uh, is it redundant? Uh, sure, if, if any one piece fails, we still have an anchor. Um, is it equalized? Yeah, we get a lot more equalization here. Uh, if, you, if you're gonna have multiple directions of pull, for example, like a multi-pitch anchor, where um, they aren't necessarily just going straight up afterwards, but out to the side or something like that, um, this could be a better equalized anchor. Um, and then the extension. Sure, we have some extension, but we also have the extension limiter knots to, to prevent it from going too far. Um, so again, all trade-offs. I don't use this anchor very much just because uh, it's not efficient enough time-wise for me to usually justify building one. Here's another interesting anchor alternative just to think about how the different points in Serene stack up. I learned this from Paul Rafelson's website. It's called the ACR Anchor, and it involves tying a beefy rappel ring um, into your cordelette. So you do this at home before you ever go on a climb. I'm gonna untie my cordelette. Then I'm gonna take my um, fat rappel ring, and I'm gonna pass the, the cordelette through pass it through a second time so that I've got that nice extra loop in there. Then retie my cordelette. Okay, so uh, come up to my anchor. I've cloved to keep the knot in place, clipping the opposite side piece of gear, leaving the middle out for now, and then grabbing the strand that goes over the rappel ring there and bringing that up to the middle. So now, if I grab the ring and that strand in the back, 
bring it all down together. Clip that with a locker that can be my tie-in. And then if I go further down the rope, put my figure eight into one of the original pieces of Pro. So, how do we feel about Serene and this anchor? Well, uh, is it solid? Well, we want to look at the trad gear, make sure that it's well placed and in good rock. The cordelette is, is full strength. Uh, the rappel ring that's involved here is full strength. Um, is it efficient? Well, there were no extra knots to tie once I uh, was out here and had my cordelette set up with the ring on it. Um, so it didn't take me very long to set up um, and I only need one locker for my tie in here since I'm using one of the non lockers on Pro uh, for the backup. Um, is it redundant? This is an interesting point because if there was a cut here, there's no power point knot joining this all together to make the other legs independent. One cut would cause the rappel ring to, to run out of the, all of the cord. The thing that's necessary to make it redundant is using the climbing rope with that figure eight back up into one of the pieces. Um, is it equalized? Yeah, so this is, this is much better at equalizing than um, than the cordelette anchor, since since the rope can run through the rappel ring. Um, and how about extension? Well, there is a whole lot of extension if, if one piece unclips, but it's not the end of the world, um, and it's a trade-off. How about an anchor for repelling? Let's say that we've got these two bolts and we want to repel off of them. So we want our anchor to be efficient, especially in terms of gear. We're willing to spend more time to use less gear. So we get out things like our knotted nylon runners. We're willing to take the time to untie them and retie them through the bolts. Generally, I don't want runners directly on the bolts because there could be sharp burrs on the inside that damage the runner, but repelling is a lower force situation than climbing falls, and I'm willing to take the risk of the runner getting slightly damaged since I'm leaving it behind and this is its last use. So, I've got my untied runners that I'm threading through. And we're gonna put a carabiner on the bottom of this. It would be expensive, like if I had to leave a couple of beaners. Uh, a cheaper option are aluminum repel rings. And so two different options. Um, there's these really light SMC ones that um, are about $3 a piece. And if I'm setting up a repel anchor that I know a lot of other people are gonna use after me, I double them up. I use two to make it redundant. There's also um, some bigger repel rings, like this is the Omega Pacific fat repel ring, and it's about $4.50. So still cheaper than a beaner, and it's enough that I trust using it on its own. I don't feel the need to double it up. To build my rappel anchor, I tie both of my runners in a loop uh, through, through the rings. Water knots. There's one, now the other. Okay, so there we go. I've got two separate tied runners, each through one of the pieces of Pro, and then each of the runners is tied through both of these little SMC aluminum rappel rings. And I feel pretty good rappelling off of this. Uh, I would cinch up my water knots by pulling on each four ways. 
both tails, both inner strands, tail and opposite inner strand, tail and opposite inner strand. And so do that for both to really make sure they're cinched down because you're gonna trust your life to this and make sure those tails are at least a few inches long. That one's a little short. So, Serene, um, how do we feel about the strong? Well, if it's two bolts like this, we feel pretty good about it. Sometimes it's trad gear, sometimes it's a tree. Um, efficient, very efficient in terms of gear. The total money that I'm losing here is less than $10, whereas it would be much, much more if I left behind my own trad gear plus beaners at every clip-in point um, and beaners for down here. So this is efficient in saving me money, uh, but not efficient in terms of time. So always make sure your climb ends ahead of time in case you need to rig new rappel anchors. Um, redundant, yeah, we've got two completely independent slings, so that's redundant. Um, is it equalized? Yes, in this direction of pull. It's a little bit tricky when tying the slings as separate knots to get them exactly equalized. Um, it can take some extra fiddling and cost you extra time. And no extension. If one bolt failed, um, there wouldn't be a whole lot of extension in the, the master point where the rappel rings are. Another way to rig a rappel anchor, especially if I need to do it off of three pieces of gear, is to use my cordelette itself. And if you plan to just use your cordelette to leave as a rappel anchor, then you don't have to tie it, bring as many tied runners on the climb. So I'm gonna take my cordelette, I'm gonna untie it, I've got my two rappel rings as well. And I'm gonna thread the end of the cordelette through each of the pieces of pro that I want to incorporate in my rappel anchor. So through one bolt, then through both of the rings, through another bolt, and these could just as easily be pieces of trad gear that you're leaving, so that gets expensive. Again, after the, through the piece of pro, I go through the rings, and then the last one. And one more time through the rings. In the end, finish it up with uh, whatever knot you prefer to tie off your cordelette. I, I do the double fisherman. and then pull it so that everything ends up equalized. Make sure you get the knot uh, a little bit away from whatever piece of pro. So I've got everything equalized, and now to make it redundant, I'm gonna tie it off with a power point, just like we did on the cordelette. So how about that rappel anchor? Serene? Well, whatever the types of pro are, they need to be solid. Uh, is it efficient? Well, now I'm only leaving behind one cordelette rather than two single runners, uh, but cost-wise, it's probably about the same. Uh, though I will say it took me a lot less time to build than the two separate runners, so in that sense, it's definitely more efficient. Um, redundant? Yeah, I've got independent legs. Um, redundant rings if it's the small one, or I'm okay with it being just one ring if you use uh, the fat Omega Pacific or um, the SMC like burgundy colored ones. Um, equalized, yeah, in this one direction of pull, just like the cord of lead, if we go off to the side, then we end up with a slack arm and all the load on one. Uh, no extension, yeah, there's not a whole lot of extension here. So this is a great way to rig a rappel. Uh, I learned this from the AMGA uh, outdoor research video, so. Thank you for the people who made those. Another detail about good anchors is that when setting up a rappel anchor or a top rope anchor, you wanna make sure that it is extended out enough that the rope can come over the edge. This one is bad because it causes the rope to rub on the edge of the cliff here. As a rappel anchor, if I were to get all the way down to the bottom and then try to pull this, there may be enough friction from the rope on top that it gets stuck even if nothing else is going wrong. It would be much better to extend it out over. Here we go, this is much better. Now the rope can run smoothly without interfering with the top of the cliff or the edge. It's gonna make pulling your rope after the rappel much better and any side to side abrasion happens to the material that you're leaving behind, not your expensive climbing rope that you wanna keep using.
Okay, we've talked a lot about how to rig different anchors, but just for the sake of completeness, I want to talk about how we connect to anchors. Uh, so I've got back to my standard cordelette anchor here, and I've got a beaner in the power point. Uh, if this is going to be set up for top roping, I like to have either two opposite and opposed uh, lockers that the rope is clipped through. There we go. Uh, and this makes it completely redundant even at the point of the carabiner. If, if anything were to happen that were to work one of these lockers open um, and then the rope were to get dragged over the gate, we still don't lose our entire anchor. Um, if you don't want to use lockers for your top rope anchor, you could also use three opposite and opposed uh, non-lockers. So there's one with the gate facing right. There's a second, the gate facing left. And there's a third with the gate facing right again. And then clipping our top rope into all three beaners makes for a very redundant top rope anchor setup. Let's say that this is a multi-pitch anchor that I want to attach myself to while I stay here. Uh, so that I can't fall off the wall. I always start with a clove hitch close to my tie-in point. So, always a clove hitch on a locker to start, um, and I would do something else to back this up. There are three options uh, for backing this up. One is to go further down the rope and do a figure eight on a bite to another beaner. This could be a locker or a non-locker. You can clip it to the power point. You could clip it um, to the shelf, taking one of each of the three strands there. A second way that I could back this up is by climbing with a personal anchor on. Here I'm using a Purcell Prusik as a personal anchor. A lot of people will use um, either a knotted nylon runner or a commercially made one with individual loops uh, of material. But if I take my PA, uh, I can clip it um, to the power point or to the shelf. But the key that I have here is making sure that my power point or my uh, personal anchor is slack and that it's my clove hitch that's, that's really holding the load. This is important because if I'm belaying a leader and they fall past the anchor, we want the climbing rope, um, which is dynamic in the system, to absorb the additional forces there, as opposed to the personal anchor, which is essentially static. We don't want that involved in holding fall forces. Finally, um, if you don't back it up with a figure eight or a PA, uh, the third option would be just not to back it up with anything. Again, this is a judgment call. Uh, I do this when I'm only gonna be at an anchor for a little while, usually when I'm exchanging gear with my climbing partner and then I'm gonna set off and leave the next pitch. But if I was teaching a beginner climber uh, who could make mistakes tying their knots or open the wrong beaner at the anchor, that's when I make sure that we go back to backing things up with them using a figure eight on another beaner. Because it would be so easy for them to accidentally have tied a munter here instead of a clove. So if they have the munter and they sit back on it, the figure eight makes sure that they don't fall to their doom when, once they're off belay. The reason I start out all of those ways of connecting to the anchor with a clove hitch close to me is a couple of reasons. One, a clove is really easy to untie when weighted. All I have to do is open the beaner and dump it out. Even if it's really cinched down, the knot just goes away.
Also, uh, I'm capable of adjusting my distance to the anchor without ever opening my connection to it. So while this gate is locked, I can pull and take slack uh, from the figure eight side and then pull that over to my side. And I'm completely backed up the entire time, uh, but I can increase my distance from the anchor in case I need to go to the edge, check on the follower, etc. If you intend to use any of the anchor types shown in this video, make sure that you practice them at ground level before you need to use them on a climbing route. You don't know it from just watching it. You really need to actually do it. And remember that placing trad gear is a whole other topic. Lastly, for anyone who would like to suggest improvements or simply has a difference of opinion, I'd like to ask you not to simply type that in the comments section below. Instead, make a better video, post that. Uh, don't complain about what I've done here unless you can create something better yourself. If you create a video that is more complete, comprehensive, and correct than what I have here, that's fantastic, and I will happily use yours as a teaching tool in the future instead of this one. Please send your videos to me. Thanks. Bye.